It's a beautiful day in the gamer hood. A beautiful day for my gamers. Would you be one? Could you be one? It's out of that thunder, but don't despair. This colony's breeding great robbers. Would you be one? Could you be one? If the native is a mortality rate works for you For a few bucks a month you can sign up and have the hogs to you So let's make the most of another someday Brew up some coffee and play it my way Would you be mine? Could you be mine? Won't you be my gamers? Won't you be? Won't you please? Please won't you be my gamers? What year was the house built? Hey everybody, welcome to Mr. Hobbs' Gamerhood. Tonight we got a bonus special episode for you because we are not playing low fantasy gaming tonight. Instead, we're going to wrap up the campaign that uh, we started, I don't even know how long ago, two and a half months ago or something. And in that, we are also going to do a uh, Hobbs and Friends episode uh, with 25 guests so we can see how bad the technology affects everything. But I'm not running roll 20, so I'm almost expecting it to be better. I don't know. Hey, Beast King 1980, what's going on? Uh, I forgot to tell the guys who are going to be on the show that I'm actually not starting the show yet. This is the pre-show. So what do you think about that? So here's the regular players and a picture of Taylor. Arlen's picture looked exactly like it did before. That's awesome. But... Uh, uh, if anybody has anything they want to say, I don't usually talk to the Twitch during the uh, episode. So let me move this over some. There we go. So we're not going to talk to the Twitch during the episode. But if anyone has any questions or anything, just go ahead and put them in the chat. And then we'll pick them up in the post show. Uh, so hopefully we can do this in 40 minutes. I don't know. I don't know if we can or not. We'll see, I guess. Um, do you guys want to introduce yourself twice, or do you just want to introduce yourself once for the actually show? Hey, Trev Hart, what's up, buddy? Probably once for the actual thing. <laughs> A lot of guests, I make them do it twice. Isn't that funny? Oh, really? Mm-hmm. So the pre-show is like talking to Twitch? Yep, basically. yep, talking to Twitch gotcha. and fixing everything. And, and then that's what the post-show is as well, where we're actually doing Hobbs and Friends. It'll just be... Because that's going to be a podcast, so um, it doesn't. I heard that people don't like being listening to us talk to people who aren't on the podcast. That's all. All right. So I guess maybe we'll start. Trev Beast King. Hey, we're still doing the drawing for whatever you want. Eldritch Tales or um, Goblin Scribes uh, Class Toolkit Compendium or one of the uh, Zines, uh, Hobbs and Friends Zine. Your choice. If you are out of uh, the continental U.S., I'll probably just send you a PDF of uh, one of those things instead. What's Eldritch Tales? So this is Eldritch Tales right here. This is a white box uh, version of um, Call of Cthulhu, basically. So it's based on Swords and Wizardry white box, and it's by uh, Joe Salvatore of Raven God Games. So it's cool. a soft cover. It's very nice. It's, it's actually got some pretty cool stuff in it. He's currently working on a, uh, a fantasy game called Reavers, I think. So that's all that is. So, yeah, if you talk. So, Trev Hart and Beast King, I got you in here for another. Uh, um, and this is the first time I got you in here, Arlen. Is that weird? Hmm? You haven't chatted lately on the thing? Or you don't want my, or you don't want my prizes. Uh, well, you've been running Kalmata on Thursdays, and I have family stuff on Thursdays. So oh, I mean, but I mean, this was partly we were doing this every Tuesday too. Well, I would have been in the game last Tuesday if well, I you didn't chat. Feeling well, apparently. Oh, that's yeah, right. That was because I fell asleep because I got a bad headache, and then as soon as my painkillers picked in, kicked in, I, uh, you know, that was that. Asleep. Yeah. Oh. I, I assume that as players, we are not eligible to be. Oh no, you're eligible. I don't care. You're eligible. Oh, we are. <laughs> yeah, why not? I will cool. leave it to viewers. Oh, that's nice of you. All right, Zach looks super serious. He's like, I could be working on my campaign stuff right now. <laughs> 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 no, no, that's hundred percent ready to go. All right, 
All right. So, um, yeah, I guess no one's really saying anything. So I got to remember to actually, I got to start Zencaster. Start recording. And then we'll see what happens. All right. You guys ready for me to do that? And then I'll do an introduction for Hobbs and Friends. And then, like I said, I'll introduce you guys. And then we'll just start talking about Jesus, this. The process sounds so complicated. Just do it. It is complicated, man. It feels complicated to me, bro. I'm like terrible at this stuff. I, a lot of times I say it out loud, though. So uh, not only do you know what I'm doing, I can say it out loud and say, no, that makes no sense. Why would I do that? But Arlen, you know. I thought you did. Uh, aren't you on one of Hobbs's podcasts? Yeah. OK. So I I'm just, been, I'm just been making fun of Hobbs. I'm okay. not really <laughs> opposed to the idea of talking through what we're going to do. <laughs> All right. Enough of that. All right, so we're just going to do it. I want to write down when it actually starts, though. So it's 12.30 right now at uh, 12.45. I'm going to start it. So fart or do whatever you got to do. Hey, everyone. Welcome to Mr. Hobbs' Gamerhood. I am your host, Jason Hobbs, and today I have a vast array of guests it's going to be a special Hobbs and friends bonus episode where we tell you how to wrap up a campaign by seeing how poorly i did it and then you can learn from my bad <laughs> mistakes hopefully so um shoot let's see here what do i gotta do i gotta introduce some guests of the week all right so it seems to me that I should move this over here, and then I should say, uh, I guess we have a guy who is a, actually a published D and D type guy, Robert Nemeth. Right, Robert, go ahead. Why don't you say something about yourself and uh, say hey? Hey, everybody. I'm Robert. Um, you might know me more on social media by the the handle of Nola Bert, since I'm from New Orleans. Um, Hobbs is, is uh, alluding to the fact that I have a zine published uh, for Five Torches Deep called The Hidden Necropolis. That came out in 2020 for Zine Quest 2. Awesome. All right. Next up is uh, the man who has a podcast and a YouTube channel called Live from Pelham's Wasteland, Arlen. Uh, hi, I'm Arlen. Um, as... Hobbs said, I have a podcast and a YouTube channel called Live from Pelham's Wasteland. You can check them out if you're interested. His better uh, thing is probably a literary live show called The Librum Society, but I don't know if that's better. Actually. Uh, the Librum Society only has like seven episodes to listen to, so. That's all right. It'll have more, <laughs> I think. All right. Next up is, uh, I don't have any way to do a big introduction for you. So it's Zach. Yeah, uh, well, this is Zach, and uh, no big introduction because I'm not on any social media. I have no podcast, no YouTube or Twitch. Uh, I think I mostly just know Hobbs from talking at GaryCon. Yeah, man, for sure. Yeah. That's awesome. You know, actual in-person interactions back in the day. Mm, that sounds terrible. Yeah, weird. <laughs> All right, a guy who I've been gaming with online for... Uh, a decade maybe on and off i don't know elliot yeah something like that yeah it's been a while been on and off on different games um so yeah it's been it's been fun you don't know me from anywhere else besides occasionally when i'm on here uh that's right on the random games i've been a part of uh so you and arlen are the only two that i have never met in person uh and hopefully this year maybe i'll get to meet arlen in person if i can cast from north texas and get him to come one day to for lunch or something then i'll get to meet him in person you don't care about elliot no just kidding man oh, thanks. just kidding that. all right we talked about it one time at, there was some convention a long time ago where we were going to try to get everybody from whatever game that was that we were playing at the time but it didn't work out i think it was like dragon con or something i think so something like that yeah yeah all right so um what about, I think I'll just go down the line quick. And so people, uh, they know uh, briefly about you, but just a couple more things like, 
why don't we, if you want to say like what you're doing, like the last games you played or something like that, so people know that you actually play games and you don't just talk on the internet about it. So, Zach, you got any games you've been playing or is it just this one? Uh, no, for about seven months now, my in-person game, which I am actually lucky enough to have a group that I, I work with that we, we get together to play uh, every week or bi-weekly when we can. Uh, we've been going through the classic Masks of Nyarlath attack campaign for Call of Cthulhu. Uh, I'd say after seven months, we're about halfway through that. They're kind of coming to a head. They're figuring things out. So enjoying that. I, I bet. also do have a group that I, I run games uh, for online quite a bit. We've done a lot of uh, Hyperborea, a um, couple of OSC games, and I'm actually getting ready to start up another OSC game with those those guys. I, I think it's been a couple of months at least since I played with them. So, yeah, I'll be starting up the next campaign. So I have to tell you that I'm really intimidated by that Call of Cthulhu campaign. Not because I'm afraid of uh, Call of Cthulhu or a long-term campaign. It's because I can't pronounce a Nihilatherotep. So <laughs> it's all unpronounceable. Yeah. All the right. What more a... blasphemous gibberish you do, the better. I see. What about you, Elliot? Um. Well, I, as far as like, quote-unquote credentials, uh, I was no, not credentials. Just what have you been games gaming? Are... What have you been playing? Oh, oh, oh uh, well, I run a game for that we've been playing for let's see five years now um with the group that i went to college with and then i've been running that pretty consistently it's just been uh well for a little while we did dark sun uh using 5e which was interesting and then now we're playing dungeons of the mad mage um for a while we did warhammer fantasy roleplay old old stuff um the enemy within campaign for a bit um so yeah been running games pretty consistently through that stuff and then playing here i'm also playing in a superheroes game which has been pretty fun all right uh arlen um yeah i was just i was going through my roll 20 games list to see what i've been playing recently because i play a whole bunch of different stuff um but i i think the biggest one that I've done recently is I ran um, One Ring 2nd Edition for a while. Um, started We started a couple weeks after the Alpha PDF came out and then played through um, fairly recently, maybe like the end of November of 2021, um, and uh, got to the point where we got the, the final PDFs of 2nd Edition to play with. So that was a kind of a fun development in the campaign. Everybody going over, you know, changes to the PDF and trying to figure out what we needed to use and what we couldn't. Um, but I also, I played a lot of, I played a number of old school games, even though I didn't play any back in the day. Um, played a fair bit of uh, AD&D Second Edition and uh, Astonishing Swordsman and Sorcerers of Hyperborea in its Second Edition, which obviously is now just Hyperborea now that it's in its Third Edition, um, and some OSC and a bunch of other stuff. Um, yeah, I don't know. Is that, is that what you wanted Hobbs or anything else? Way too much. Way too much. Kind of figured. No, I'm just kidding. You did fine. All right. Okay. Perfect. My favorite, one of my oh. favorite games that I'm super intimidated to run is the great pin dragon campaign because the great pin dragon campaign sounds super fun. And I love Arthurian literature, hence the live from Helm's wasteland name, but, uh, yeah, 80 years of in game sounds like a lot so we'll see maybe when sixth edition comes out I'll <laughs> all right looks like we got robert left uh i've got two in-person groups uh one that i've been running a two-year campaign about now uh the um doing the into the borderlands uh original adventures reincarnated from goodman games uh added stuff to it too so that's with 5e uh that group i sometimes uh, I'm a player in campaigns for 5e and then a subset of that group I've just started an OSC campaign but we've just done session zero and then since then it's been uh, stuff getting in the way uh, some some COVID stuff and some other stuff is that homebrew uh, or the OSE one's going to be homebrew but I'm going to drop in uh, like incandescent grottos in there and stuff like that too in the excavation of the tomb of Lorna Nain, are you going to drop that in? 
I hadn't planned on that, but that's now bullshit. that you say it, maybe I should. Yeah, that's bullshit. <laughs> All right, perfect. I have it. You know, I have it. I got yeah. it from you at yeah. uh, at Game Hole. Awesome. Um, and then you know, I'm on an, in an on again, off again, uh, swords and wizardry campaign, but it's mostly been off off. So not a campaign, but a one shot. <laughs> a long one shot that's been like long, six sessions or something like that it's been a long time mainly because we haven't been able to play it started as a play test of uh glenn seals the sheep the new sheep thing what's it called you know uh it's hard for me to remember the name it's out it's, now it's some kind of weird yeah. sheep thing but so, so they, they do with midlands uh no sheep. No, it doesn't have to be Midterlands. It's being run. Edwin uh, Nagy is running it from Frog God Games. All right. So, uh, but I think in the next month, I will probably open up the North Marches for that group again. That's going to be my weekly game. So that'll be fun. All right. So that sounds awesome. I'm glad to be hanging out with such affluent and uh, affluent players. So let's get into the... Uh... Wow. Let's get into the actual topic. So we've been playing a campaign. I can't remember. Uh, so Robert, you've played every single session so far, or I guess every session, I shouldn't say so far. And it was a low fantasy gaming called the Lost Lake. And I'll say right now to everybody listening, we never got to the Lost Lake. We got close, but we never got to the Lost Lake. Um, but it, the whole concept of the campaign was uh, lost shit i did some notes somewhere but now i don't know where they are like what i wanted to talk about it was supposed to be a low fantasy gaming campaign the conceit of the game was all the player characters were involved in a caravan that was attacked and destroyed and they'd been uh fleeing for two days now what do you do you're basically lost in the jungle and uh we kind of did that uh i don't know i would give it on um you know a scale of one to five swords i'd give it maybe three swords i don't know um does anyone else and I, the reason i say that well maybe i'll go last why doesn't someone else go uh, uh elliot you want to say like what you think of the concept maybe just like the overall concept of the campaign and how successful it was uh sure yeah um i mean as far as the concept like the conceit of the game was really interesting i think whenever we first started out um i will say i i guess going from whatever bad to good uh i don't know if it actually necessarily felt like it completely followed through on the original conceit totally um as far as it felt like it was there were a couple things that it could have done and i think we ended up kind of floundering slightly between the two um where like the first part seemed like it was really interesting of figuring out why was the caravan there and stuff and we had heard about like the fight or like the it, we being attacked and stuff like that and that was interesting and then there was also then just getting out of the jungle. And it was kind of like we ended up falling more on the side of just trying to get out because I think because of scheduling stuff too, it started to hit where it was a little bit hard to delve into some of those other things as much as I felt like there could have been. Like I really liked the little like flashbacks and stuff that we did in one session. Um, and some of those other little points of like, finding the priest and stuff like that but like there's a couple things that didn't necessarily seem that it fit as well um in that and then it became more of just like we'll get out and then there's also ursa in here and then like if that makes sense like it just it, it kind of uh felt like we bounced around a little bit and i don't think that was entirely because of the conceit of the game i think that was a lot to do with the fact that two characters died immediately and then one player dropped out and then we had two new players and then we had people in and out, and then we had scheduling issues. I mean, like, there's a lot of other stuff that I think also delayed the, like, ability to really jump in and dig into a few of those other, what I thought was really interesting of the, the potential concept. The good part of it, though, is it was still interesting. It did feel like, like in a jungle, I liked all of the characters. I liked almost all of the interactions that we had in and of themselves. I just don't know if they necessarily like created a campaign really. Yeah. Yeah. Felt like a string of one shots together. or something. Yeah. So how many swords buddy? Um, I would give it uh, three. It's probably actually a three out of five. Yeah. I think that's uh, pretty apt actually. All right. What about you, Arlen? 
All right. On a scale of one sword to five swords, I will give it a sharpened halberd, a morning star, and a scimitar. Um, one sword? That's kind of rough. No, he gives it three. That I think that counts as three. But he just they weren't all the same. Anyway, I'm glad I didn't have to say it. <laughs> so, um, so I actually wasn't here for the kind of initial um, sessions. I joined about halfway through, um, which I think puts a little bit of a different perspective on the uh, the kind of experience of the campaign. Um, partly because the stuff that I was here for was kind of moving away from the original kind of react to being stranded in the jungle and more into the period of kind of um, characters starting to kind of take agency or take action that's related to kind of um, stuff beyond just how do we survive until tomorrow. Right, because it seems like that's part of the the idea of starting a campaign like this is that you have a, a really strong, um, a, a really strong drive, especially at the beginning of the campaign where survival is really difficult. Right, that you have the characters and they don't have all their gear and they're you know out in the middle of the wilderness. What are they going to do? That adds a lot. Um, I think in my experience that what um, can happen is kind of similar to is similar to what Elliot was saying and similar to what I think happened in this campaign where I think it can be difficult to smoothly transition from kind of that um, orientation of, of kind of player decision making and player actions into a, a more kind of more like a like a sort of traditional sandbox concept where the players are tr like you know investigating things that they're interested in and following up on leads they're interested in and all that sort of stuff that it, it can be i think really difficult to um sort of turn that original momentum from the kind of inciting incident into momentum for the whole campaign if that makes sense um i think there was some of that i i certainly enjoyed what we played um, I actually haven't, so I missed the, the last session um, because of uh, health issues, um, or rather because I fell asleep when my painkillers kicked in to get rid of my headache, but I'm going to call that health issues. Anyway, um, uh, and I haven't watched the last session back on, on YouTube or Twitch. Um, I've, I'm like 30 minutes in because um, I started at one point, and then I haven't gone back and watched the rest of it sorry um so i don't know a whole lot about kind of the the um kind of final situation that the players got into i can say that from the session before where i played it definitely felt like there was sort of a a reckoning coming if that makes sense that we were kind of getting close to the end of a, a storyline but it also seems like in some ways it wasn't sort of the the storyline that um the campaign started with if that makes sense and that's kind of an interesting way to to describe it because there's you know right emergent play is based on kind of not having like a preset storyline but that on some level basically what i'm saying is that we it sounds to me like the campaign started with the idea of you know survive in the jungle you're alone and then ends at a point of what well, you guys have kind of followed these leads to their natural conclusion and you're done with that and those are sort of two different things if that makes sense well i agree with you uh i do think that the, there's two things that are kind of fighting against each other uh a sandbox and a lot of different players and trying to do it all in a limited amount of time i don't want to talk yeah. too much about that because i want to see what other people think what do you think zach uh yeah so i was one of the players that joined i think on session three i think you guys had had two sessions before i was in uh, and then I cut all the rest of them to the end, which I was glad I was able to uh, make it to all of them. Uh, so I missed that initial setup that uh, you talked about, uh, Elliot. And the concept that I walked into was you're just lost in the jungle trying to get out of this, uh, which, to be honest, is not usually a camping setup that I like. Uh, whether it's like you start in the dungeon or you start in the wilderness or something. I, I kind of like the more options that you get when you have a home base and you can kind of get more into planning. 
Uh, so I, it, I think that first session that we had it kind of felt like, okay, we're going to walk in a straight path this way for a while and see what happens. And it was the most linear of the sessions that we had. Uh, but then as we, we went, um, there was a lot going on in the gym. <laughs> it, felt like, uh, it felt like, like I said to you earlier, if we had a few more films to play, we could just keep on chasing after these things and mm-hmm. try to figure out what these different uh, groups in the jungle are, are about and stuff. Uh, as far as an arc, it did feel like the rescue of the priest Bellman became sort of our main just in the timelines that we had, like, all right, that's that's the thing that we want to do, uh, so that we have a, a victory to hang our, yeah. our hat on. How so, many swords? Uh, uh, yeah, I give that a solid three, definitely. All right, well, it, it, it started off a little bit on rougher, but I thought it got it got better with every session. Uh, and though that last session, uh, I thought was it, it was the most enjoyable session that we had. I think. Awesome, cool. All right, Robert, what do you think? Uh, first off, I think you have a penchant for choosing Lost as a descriptor in all of your true. adventures. So that's the first thing I'm, I'm going to mention. Um, Wait a second. What else has Lost in it? Uh, lost on Agata. That's two. And aren't you looking for a Lost library in some other game? They're looking for a library, but it's not called uh, Lost. What's, what's the well, name of the... You literally described it as Lost Library in whatever one of your other things. Well, that's just the name of that session. <laughs> What's the name of your zine? What's the the tomb of excavation of the tomb oh, of excavation? I thought it was the lost tomb. No. Okay. So I, I think you should rescind that immediately. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> Go ahead. Um, so for me, I'd I'd probably say uh, four swords here. Um, I've not played in a campaign that started with that sort of conceit of being lost in the wilderness and then sort of figuring out where to go from there. So that was unique for me. So that probably makes it, uh, you know, a, a special experience uh, then in that in that regard. Um, but I, I mean, I think you put a, a ton of work into, you know, uh, all of the things that happen in any of the sessions. So I, I really appreciate that. Um, and to be, you know, a player in, in those games. Um, so that was that was really cool. I agree with uh, Elliot in terms of part of what I think has kind of made uh, this a little rougher had to do with the the who was playing and who dropped out. And then we also played over the holidays. And so the holidays got, I think, in the way there. Um, but Otherwise, I, I enjoyed it. I had a lot of fun. I'm, you know, you know, I, I've shown up for every single one. I was surprised that you said, I, I think, I think it's over already. <laughs> I thought we we're going to go for a little bit more, but, um, but I had, I had a good time. I, in some ways, I think that you have the benefit of being in every session. So you really totally know from start to beginning how everything kind of went from being wide open and then slowly narrowed into an objective and i'm not saying that the objective was always the saving of Felman the priest at all because it wasn't at all it wasn't in any way whatsoever um but i think it kind of turned into that and i wanted to be mini campaigns because i just didn't want a campaign to go on endlessly and i've never really finished a campaign in a way that hey this is the start and this is the finish and this isn't the end of the campaign i should say that if any of the players want to get together and I like, I wrap up some things and I want to get back to it. I'm like, Hey, I want to do another few, uh, five or six sessions of something. And it could be, you know, where we finished with these guys, or it could be somewhere else. Cause maybe only a couple of you guys want to play and then we can bring those characters back and do something. Uh, I do want to say that I, I plan on, I have a couple different things like the, the, the skink hole that you guys found, I'm going to run an adventure in at a con of players starting inside that situation. I think it's BS or con. So they'll start, they'll be the captured uh, caravan people that are inside those caverns that I had kind of mentioned to you guys and they'll break out and then they'll have to flee the jungle and whatever happens happens. It's only going to be a four hour session. So it could just be getting out of the skink hole for all I know. I don't know. Uh, but I am also going to run it exactly like we ran this in a four hour session too. And um, I think Elliot you, or uh, Arlen made a good point and someone else probably would have later, but the whole idea of it just being a total sandbox and you can do whatever you want there. It's always going to be 
stuff falling away as you narrow towards an objective, especially when we're saying that it's only going to be so many sessions. That's always going to happen. Uh, and further, in one of my games, there's always tons and tons of shit going on no matter what because I never know what you're going to get interested in and I and I have ADHD with what I like, so I'll add a bunch of stuff and then it's really up to you what you want to do. Uh, I would say that this also went into a lot of the same situations that other people have in a sandbox game that there's, you know, there's like confusing. We don't know what we want to do. We don't really know the setting that well. We haven't really played this game system that often. So there's a lot of things that will go into that that make it be an issue. Um, so I think the first thing that I would say, if you're going to run a campaign in a mini campaign like this, maybe you don't say you're going to finish it in six sessions without f helping focus the characters ahead of time. Um, like not everyone got to be involved in the flashback. So they didn't really know what those were all about. Just Arlen and um, Robert got to do that. So I think that helped make some focus. So like when I do this in a con game, I'll probably like put, you know, just some notes. Hey, your character was this, you know, this about that. And if they feel like they want to try and chase down Lord Venka and go after whatever he was, then they'll do that. It, maybe that'll help. You know, that's a lot of times in a con game, I'm going to focus it more than it just being wide open. Like it was in this circumstance. Do, does anybody have any thoughts what they think would have made it a better game? or a better mini campaign. Zach, you want to start or? Um, <laughs> sorry, I am saying like every session, uh, like I said, with the same box and a lot of stuff going on, it seemed like there was another thing that we could have gone mm -hmm. after. So you would have done less yeah. things. Well, no, any of those things would have been fine, but knowing mm -hmm. if you knew from the start that we were going to do six sessions or whatever it is, uh, just, picking one, making it more focused, be yeah. more about that. So that it's like, okay, we're going to make it about that thing. I, I should have as a GM or the player should have. Either, you know, hey, both. It, it can always <laughs> come from, uh, you know, somebody in the caravan giving us a little more direction to begin with, or just us collectively deciding, okay, here's what we want to accomplish in the next few sessions. Uh, okay. It's a little bit harder probably for the players that early in that we don't know enough like is this thing that we hear about is that actually going to be a worthy thing to do for the next few sessions or maybe that's just a one session deal. you know we, we don't know necessarily how to how to weigh yeah one of the things i don't want to do is force is force people any certain direction but i do know that it would actually could help so it's something i'm trying to work in more uh, robert you seem well, like you had something to add or no it looks like elliot's like dying to talk go for it buddy no no I mean, well, I was going to say, just judging back on what he was saying is, I mean, I think when you're talking specifically about short campaigns like this was, right, I think it actually does benefit to lessen the scope to be more impactful to hit those points quicker. And I think a lot more of the almost the feeling of GM Railroad can be forgiven, especially at the beginning, to get the conceit rolling and then allow for divergent based on player choices when the idea is specifically with short campaigns, right? Like if it's a long campaign, you want it to be open. I was just reading the, um, uh, the Ravenloft game where you start out and technically it, it kills all of the characters in the first, like first encounter of the game, their heads get taken and then this lich is telling them to do things, right? That's obviously an extremely railroad start. If the point is to only play for six sessions and get like, a thing right like you kind of almost do want to have something that does hit like quick and hard which was an interesting start at this one but i felt then it kind of dropped us into like um like what uh he was saying of there was too many things to go for and we were going we only have six sessions i'm not sure where like what we can like actually find out in that amount of time because we were just like okay you're in the jungle and we're like well okay is there a mountain like we weren't really sure, you know what I mean? And and they, it, we would have, I think, felt like if we had more time, we could have definitely built a lot of those things. As we said, there's tons of stuff, like, around. And mm -hmm. that was, I think, that's where it felt. Just those first couple of sessions felt a little too aimless. And that could that's partially on us, you know. Um, that's, I, think I don't think so. Good. I think that's the – that's the it happens almost all the time in games like this. And I would say part of it was an experiment – 
to see what you would do. Like, are the, are they going to try and track the caravan and go back to it now after two days? And you guys talked about doing that, but you were like, oh, why would we do that? Because all these creatures that have bombarded the caravan would kill us, which is all we, all, also a possibility. So I don't really think, I don't think there is a right or wrong there. And, um, but to make a campaign better and more enjoyable in the future, I probably will have a specific goal in mind. Uh, it was just something I've always wanted to do. So uh, that's why I did it. Robert? Yeah, I would say the first few sessions seemed like it was focused primarily on like survival. And then we we're looking to sort of get to some sort of safe, safe place. And then once we encountered Irks, it seems like then things had much more of a focus. Hmm. Interesting. Arlen? Yeah, I think I mostly um, echo what what everyone else has said. That I I think that because Hobbs, you're talking, you were talking about the idea of kind of the the focus gradually being kind of funneled down mm-hmm. into something specific. And I think um, in a uh, sort of more more kind of traditional sort of free form amount of time campaign that often you want to kind of have the focus shift down and back up and down and back up, right? So you have sort of like a, a specific, uh, like a mission that the characters are going on that's more focused and then they kind of get more freedom to explore and then it gradually kind of goes back and forth. Um, I think, I guess what I'll say is I don't know if you have enough time to really kind of give the players, I guess, uh, you know, if the players take three sessions to decide what it is that they want to accomplish over the course of the six sessions, then they only have three more sessions to actually accomplish that. And um, so I think it would it would help to have more of a kind of uh, a, a specific target to work towards from the beginning in some ways. It doesn't have to like eliminate kind of the, the other wacky things that might happen in the campaign by any means. But like if, I guess what I'm saying is if, the, if it's a succession campaign to survive the jungle and get back to territory that's not full of terrible stuff, it seems like um, on both the, the players and the game master, it's important to kind of keep that goal in mind and you know work towards that and all of that sort of stuff. Yeah, I agree with you. And uh, like I say, I probably wouldn't necessarily do it exactly like this. And I'm going to that's one of my focuses and I'm glad that's one of the reasons I wanted to have this conversation is so when I do run the actual con game, I'll have some ideas on how to better do that. Basically Uh, have more information right on the character sheets for each individual character. So they can say, Hey, I really think this is what my character wants to do. And then there was, there's going to be a time I'm going to want, want that half hour or so in the beginning when I'm explaining the characters and how the system works. And then they'll be like, Oh, Hey, my character wants to do this. Well, my character wants to do this and then they'll have to decide what they want to do because I do like that. I do like the feeling of that. And it, to me, it maybe brings a, I don't know, some relatable kind of idea that each character is an individual when they have the opportunity to individually showcase their character, even if it's just talking about what their character may want to do and then come to a consensus. Um, I, what I thought maybe we could do is if we could super fast maybe give a synopsis of the, of the campaign of what happened. And then uh, I would give you the last scene as I saw it and tell you just like, I think the spectators may want to know, and maybe you guys want to know. Um, I don't know if I told you in this beginning, but a lot of times definitely for Kalmata and the emergent empires, every session that I run is, con- is not necessarily in the same exact timeline, but it's in the same setting. So like I have, uh, I had the Chronicle of the Cursed Axe that was in the Midlands and I ran that for 15, I don't even know if it was that, maybe 15 sessions or something. Well, that happened in this same Midlands. So they're all in the same one. They're not all separated. The Midlands campaign that I have is also in the same one. So it's all kind of canonical with different campaigns affecting each other possibly, but they're never going to really meet each other, right? That's the idea anyway, but things that happen could affect other campaigns or like the next story I will tell, maybe we'll go after this if it's your characters or theirs or whatever. So um, basically the whole idea was the caravan smashed. You guys escaped the caravan. A few guys got together. They got in a fight with these things called skinks that are like, um, 
um, lizard men, not as tough as the lizard men that destroyed the caravan, but they were obviously searching for something and it made the characters felt like maybe them or any of the other remnants of the caravan for some reason. Uh, which to me was this idea that likely these guys are connected to the other lizard men. There's a connection there between the lizard men, different lizard men tribes and really different lizard men species. Um, but following that, you ended up finding maybe the home area of these skinks and then two guy, two characters died. And then uh, you fled that and then we grew, got the other two characters and that's where Irks joined and that's where Launt decided, you know, hey, I want to find this Thelman guy. And I think Irks definitely was a GM voice saying, here's something that you guys could go do and we can finish that and that would probably be a good way to end the campaign. I didn't expect it to go exactly like I did. Uh, you guys followed the path that Irks took and then that's when you found the tomb of the Sin Eater and then you basically delved the whole tomb of the Sin Eater nominally in search of this Thelman guy, but possibly some treasure as well. And uh, got out of that saved Irks, saved Eddard, one of the brazen shields. There's a lot of NPCs that were kind of peripherally involved in the campaign. And we only saw a few of them and I had a shit ton more. Um, and then after doing that, you still hadn't found Thelman yet, but you happened upon a uh, Urson compound. Uh, and that's where you found Thelman and another charade and basically snuck into the compound and freed Thelman executed Sherrod and, uh, got away. Um, <laughs> that was the surprise <laughs> of the whole campaign. <laughs> it was a good one. Yeah, coming. <laughs> uh, and then you, you learned a lot of things from Sherrod about some of the surrounding area, uh, according to Bartok, the, the leader of the Urson. And, uh, we had discussed like maybe doing some of those things to finish up the campaign as going by, but I knew that was never going to get done in two sessions. And I really wanted to, uh, have this over with before February started, um, because I wanted to start my other game, the, the North March. I really wanted to restart that mini campaign and, uh, and I wanted to allow Zach to play in his. So, and I had prompt, I mean, I don't know when we started this, but it's had to have been like 12 weeks, right? <laughs> <laughs> maybe mm -hmm. for something that was only supposed to last six weeks after that, breaks and everything. Yeah. 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 Just from breaks and, and holidays. So, uh, so the way I saw, does anyone have anything they want to add? Like, uh, Arlen, do you have anything you want to add to that synopsis? Uh, no, I think that was a good, that, that certainly fits with, uh, what, how I would describe the section of the campaign that I was in. Okay. Uh, Elliot. No, I think it was all, I mean, yeah, there was pretty much the summary of it. <laughs> I should I should have said Lot got his hand at vomit acided off. And should I have added that? I don't know. Oh, yeah, 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 that's true. <laughs> what I would say is if anyone wants to know more about the campaign, check it out on YouTube. You can watch every session. Uh, Robert, did you have anything that you felt was uh, integral or no? No, I mean, it's still in my head. I tend to think of it as like a two-phase campaign. The first, the first part where we're just kind of like, uh, looking to get out and survive and the whole first sort of like encounters we experienced you know I didn't make the connection at all that there these uh, skinks might be related to the other lizard men but uh, I just basically thought of this as this is a really dangerous place and we have to kind of sort of watch ourselves and try to get out of here um, so I think that was the whole first part is we're trying to get out. And then we got some direction when we found Irks because we learned that there were some other leads we could follow that could get us two things that my character, Emery, I think would be interested in. Treasure, one. I mean, we're, we're, we had a job to do. We lost everything. We're out here. I don't want to lose my life, but I also want to get out of here with, with some loot if I can so that this was worthwhile. Um, and I figured that this was the direction to do so, um, you know, Fellman and such would, would help us be able to get out of the jungle. So that's the way I saw it as those two, two phases, uh, kind of like wandering, trying to find our way to something that's going to get us out. And then finally finding that thing that was going to get us out and then have some, some additional benefits that we get out of it. All right. Zach, anything to add? Uh, no, pretty much agree with that. Wanted to get out of the jungle and hopefully bring some treasure and, you know, maybe rescue some people along the way. Yeah, or execute them. 
No. <laughs> All right. Don't so forget, don't, don't forget, I also contributed the albino uh, marmosets that oh, the rumors have that yeah. they're, uh, they're My... lucky, but apparently they didn't seem to do much for us. Yeah, the note's right here, man. I, I'll, I'll put that in. We'll see what happens. Like I said, I'm probably going to publish this as a 12 by 12 hex adventure, basically. And you don't, when you buy it, you would obviously not have to do the same caravan busted thing you could still be in the caravan you can do whatever you want when you buy a damn product right but uh uh i wanted to say originally i think the key thing was to get out of the jungle and the key thing that you guys had in the very first session was let's get to a high point well actually it was follow the river was the first thing and that led to the encounter uh with the skinks and then after that devastation after the second session it was like let's find a high high ground and so you headed for the nearest mountain and that's what you continued to do and reached at the end of the last session. And uh, I think I had written a little thing about, so if I was going to, if we were, if, if we would have said, Hey, let's get our characters out and all that, nothing would have happened because I feel like you guys made it up there. You talked about it. You saw that area uh, that maybe where the, the, I had mentioned like uh, the buttes where they were, where the bat creature was, and maybe where, where there was a crypt was where Bartok, the Urson was concerned about. Uh, but then, you know, it's like, hey, we see the way out and all we have to do is take it. That doesn't mean that there weren't any adventures that happened on the way out. And maybe we'll play that out at some point. Uh, maybe we won't. Maybe that'll just be a montage. Uh, but there was the uh, uh, cut scene at the end with uh, the one more of the jewels cracking and fading out, which were the ones that were protecting and keeping the Sin Eater in his tomb. And then like maniacal laughter from the Sin Eater. And the one thing I wanted to add is you guys started to move off the mountain and head west to actually free yourselves from the jungle. That's when uh, like a massive energy spike would happen and the whole sky would be alive with uh, magical energy, which people who have uh, watched anything from the uh, Chronicle of the Cursed Axe is the serpent men have enacted this massive magical ritual that is going to make the land hot so the serpent men can basically rule again and start a whole new thing which you guys would have known more if you actually would have found the lost lake so there you go but that never happened so the stuff still happens in the background in my games but it wasn't something that was that you were that interested in and you don't have to be because i didn't really put enough in there to make you interested in it and so i realized that if that's what i want you to do i should add more stuff but like I say, it was also an exercise and maybe just uh, letting it be. So, so I, go ahead. So here's something of a, I don't know what I would call this, a procedural question uh, or a metagaming question, I guess. So I know for the purposes of sort of organizing things and doing your tw Twitch stream and, and so forth, that you give names to things and that you gave this the name The Lost Lake. How much are you concerned that that's going to be like a, oh, that's an important thing that we need to worry about and focus on? The players to care about the, the name? Yeah, I don't yeah. care. Okay. The last campaign was a Chronicle of the Cursed Axe, and they never did anything with the Cursed Axe. Which is just maybe I really named my campaigns bad. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> uh, when I put this in the, uh, in the con, when you're supposed to put a description, I just called it Lost in the Jungle, baby. So maybe that's more appropriate. I don't know. All right. So I think that kind of covers that. Uh, the next thing I wanted to do is talk a little bit about low fantasy gaming, because I know some of you have played it briefly in the past. And uh, I wanted to know what you guys thought of the game system. So we'll do a quick kind of review and you guys can just give a little blurb on what you thought. We can do five swords again. So I don't think we've heard from uh, Arlen in a while. Arlen, what's your, you got a review for low fantasy gaming, you know, like a one minute review. I will give low fantasy gaming a, a Flamberge, a Claymore, a, I don't know, a four or so, four and a half, maybe. 4.5, nice. That I really like about low fantasy gaming. Um, there are a couple of things that I would change if I was going to run it. Um, from the way it's written in the book. Um, but like, I, I think that um, most of them are fairly minor. 
Um, for instance, I, I, I prefer the way that we did short rests in this campaign versus the way that they're written in the book where you just get two checks every for each of the three short rests instead of trying to keep track of did I use my three check versus did I use my one check that makes purpose. Oh, yes. There's a couple other. Um, I feel like the the weapon special effects on a 19 are um, really cool and flavorful, but I think what I would prefer is to have, like, here's a list of special effects that are available. The player picks what they want to happen when they roll a 19 out of, like, here's all the things that it could be instead of like swords always disarm somebody when you roll a 19 or axes always make them roll a, a permanent wound um but it's really just minor things like that i think lfg um for me is a, is a really quality kind of framework for um the game all right and you've played it a few times i don't think anybody else has played it more than once for this campaign basically so yeah uh elliot what do you think how many how many swords buddy um, yeah, I would give it, uh, hmm, uh, probably four, four to 4.5, um, as well, actually. Uh, I really, really liked it. Um, it was, it was my first time playing. Um, I think it's a really cool, uh, kind of midpoint between quote unquote more like old school gaming versus something newer like 5e. Um, I think it has some uh, really interesting ideas of like, of uh, some really basic ways of f making you feel kind of with that, uh, have like powers and stuff like the newer games uh, tend to do, but at the same time, not like overbearingly like tons and tons of rules. There's a few little um, rules in there that I think are cool ideas. I'm not totally convinced yet that they completely work um, in practice, but, uh, but overall, I mean, it was, it was a lot of fun. It's definitely one that I'm going to check out um, more for, my uh home games and stuff um and i think it's really really cool awesome robert uh, yeah this is my first time playing it and i i enjoyed it uh i'd probably give it somewhere between four and five as well i think the rest um were the most confusing thing to me and then i don't feel like i as my character i ever really thought much in terms of the whole exploits but that's probably me just being new to the whole system um but other than that, I, I mean, I, I like the system. The uh, the setting seems to be fairly sword and sorcery, uh, so I, I like that uh, quite a bit too. So I'm I, I wish I had it in print, uh, which I, I need to get uh, at some point because when I read PDFs, they just uh, they don't stick with me. Mm -hmm. They're great to have as references, but trying to like learn from a PDF just doesn't work for me. Uh, I don't blame you. I, I have trouble learning from a book, so I don't know. All right, Zach, the oldest school guy here. What did you think about low fantasy gaming? Um, yeah, this is the first time playing it. Um, you know, I put it you know right in the middle. It's three to me. Uh, it didn't do much anything that bothered me. Some of the, the rest stuff, I agree. Everyone seemed to have a little trouble getting that. And exploits, I think there was only one session that we really use them much that it, it was on our minds so that that kind of was just a forgotten thing uh it's not something that would would replace any of the games that i like if i'm going towards the sorcery i'm going to stick with hyperborea if i just want a basic game i'm going to stick with bx but if you wanted to run it again i'd have no objection to playing it which is good because i've had you've had objections of other games that you've played with me so yeah, that's good I, i'm opinionated i know so, well but, uh, no this did not bother me at the least as a player it's like it was completely easy to pick it up and go. So that, that's that's a so, perfectly good place to be for games. That mm -hmm. like it might not be the thing that you're gonna run, but it's the thing that is fine to play in, and that that's fine. You had something to add, Robert? Yeah, I was just gonna say uh, in terms of settings, I'm a big fan of the the primeval Thule or Thule. Uh, setting, uh, which I have the version that's written for 5e, which I don't think 5e is a good system for that at all, but I wonder if LFG would be a good system for that that setting. So for those who don't know, the setting is The Midlands, also by uh, Steve Godzicki in Pickpocket Press, which is what actually originally brought me to low fantasy gaming is because every time I kept seeing The Midlands on drive through and popping up, I was like, oh, this really seems in my it's mostly human-centric, it's Everything is relatively relatable. I like the ideas, you know. 
Yeah, and I'll then, say that even though I never played LFG before, I actually bought Midlands a long time ago, and I've read run several of his adventure frameworks from mm-hmm. that in Hyperborea. So yeah, he's got a lot of great content. content and yes, yeah. whether you go full for the rule set or not, it's, it's well done stuff. Yeah, and I would say for me, low fantasy gaming is right now one of the top two games that I play, right? So I play OSE and I run uh, low fantasy gaming. I've run tons and tons of different games before, but uh, I really like the narrative elements that uh, low fantasy gaming uh, nudges you towards. It doesn't really force it down your throat, but it nudges you kind of like DCC also nudges you towards narratively talking in your uh, combats because of the mighty deeds, which is done by the exploits. It's way more survivable. So it gives because I like to throw whatever at people. And so if you're not going to have balanced encounters, if you don't want them having new characters a lot, then this game gives you that opportunity with the rescue exploits, party retreats. So it does all the same things that a lot of old school games do, but it instead of you making it up as you go and then forgetting what the rules are, like I always tend to do in my OSC games, uh, it actually has codified methods, very simple through the exploits, and those are really cool. And then it also has nice random encounter tables that within them it doesn't only have like hazards um, and uh, uh, random encounters. It also includes narrative uh, currency for the players to gain something. And I also like the advancements per level as opposed to just, boom, you're level two now and you get all this stuff. Well, in this game you have these opportunities if you use those level advancement rules to slowly gain portions of your character, which I don't know, it's just kind of cool that after one session, Hey, I already may have maybe have more hit points because I got enough fights. I learned it or whatever. And there's different ways to do that. And I think, uh, I, he's already fixed the encounter, uh, the rest thing. I think it's the same way in, uh, low life 2090, which is his cyberpunk slash shadow run retro clone. So anyway, as far as LFG goes for me, it's five motherfucking swords. All right. I think that will wrap up the podcast. So I'm going to give everyone one opportunity to uh, say whatever they want, and then we'll hit the post show. So um, I guess at the end, what I normally ask is if you had an epitaph in the old school place or a legacy, what would you want it to be? So I don't know if anyone's really thought about it too much, but I'm going to put someone on the spot. Let's put Zach on the spot. Do you have an epitaph or a legacy in the old school, Zach? Uh, you know, um, no, I've not thought about that at all. Uh, I guess in you know the interest of being broad, nerdier than anyone, say that I was angry first. Nice. All right. Good. Robert, what about you? You got an epitaph or a legacy that you, uh, that you want to, to be for the, uh, in the old school or even in the TT, the tabletop role playing game industry. Uh, I'm hoping to put out more zines. So I'm hoping to have that as something that people know me for. That'll be your legacy. Nice. Elliot. Um, yeah. (laughs) it was about the it was it was about the friends that were made along the way nice (laughs) arlen i would like my epitaph to read one day he just disappeared so he might still be alive okay nice so uh is that a burnout or a fade away i don't know All right, everyone. I would like to thank all the patrons of Hobbs and Friends out there. I didn't bring it up for this particular one, uh, but I'll say thank you to Robert Nemeth, uh, Arlen Walker, because both of those guys are patrons and I appreciate it. Uh, And then uh, I'd always like to thank TJ Drennan for the music. And if you want to reach me uh, on the Twitters, you can reach me at, at Hobbs Indeed or at OSR and Hobbs. If you'd like to become a patron of Hobbs and Friends, www.patreon.com slash OSRN Hobbs. Meet us up at the Facebook or come come to the Gamerhood and hang out on the Discord. All right. Do you guys have any last words, Zach? Hey, thanks for the invite. It was great being able to join you for a game. Nice. Arlen? Um, yeah, it was fun. Had a, had a great time playing with everybody. Would definitely play this game or with this crew or whatever combination of whatever again. Perfect. Robert? 
Yeah, uh, I enjoyed playing with all of the players, so that includes the people that dropped out or couldn't get to play, so that was a good time. We might talk about that in the post show. Uh, Elliot. Um, yeah, it was, it was great. Enjoyed it thoroughly and hope to many more game sessions in this or other games. All right, Hobbs Goblins, stay alive. It's better to burn out than to fade away. All right, we'll talk about all those files and things when we're done with the post show. All right, I'm going to head over to the PDF perusal section. All right, here's our thing. All right, so uh, you can't see this picture because you're not looking at Twitch, but it, it looks like a barbarian with a big shield. Robert, do you know what this is and why it's here? Am I supposed to see this right now on Twitch? Yeah, you don't see anything? Oh, it just popped up. Yeah, it's a little late. Uh, yeah, there's like a little delay. Uh, I don't know. Is this supposed to be Conan? Nope. Uh, what about you, Elliot? Wait, is this is this is specific to our game? Yes, all these pictures oh. are specific to our game. Okay. Specific to the game. That I mean, it, no, it, would, it looks like one of those the barbarians from the Moors, but I don't know. I don't right. know seeing this picture in game. All right, uh, 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 um, Arlen and Zach, you want to see it? This is Borgar who was a uh, um, Hawks character that died in session number oh. two. <laughs> mm. So that just a call out. Picture. <laughs> yeah, just a call, call out to Hawks character who. Uh, Hawk named his character Borgar? I might. I, I don't even know. I think it is Borgar, no. though. Isn't that weird? No? What was it? His, his character is named Sigmar. Oh, this is yeah, Sigmar. Sigmar. <laughs> That's how memorable it is to me, too. This is Sigmar, y'all. <laughs> <laughs> and, and how did Sigmar die again? Wasn't it just like he jumped and that was it? Well, he fell into the like the flying leeches that then sucked his blood out and killed him. At the same time that Melwit, my character, also died. Right. From the same but didn't he take a lot basically. of damage from the fall? Like he tried to do some major exploit at that point and failed. They both did, and it's Sturges. Yeah, Sturges just, just swarmed him, and yeah, he had fallen, and then was like bleeding out and dying and then i tried to jump in to save him and then also had a terrible failure on a major exploit and so, then so my point died. my point is that 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 uh illustration might look pretty impressive but when you think about how he died it doesn't seem very impressive at all <laughs> <laughs> well i mean in in a lot of games all right what about this guy anybody know who this is what's it yes about? it's a you're not gonna know Oh, so they're going really fast. I don't know how to stop them because what I did. So basically that was a picture of Melwit uh, originally. Let me pause this thing. Oh, my God. I can't keep up with it. I got to make some more time in here. <laughs> oh, God. I only have three of them. All right. So I had a picture of Melwit, and then I had a picture of Shand, who was Taylor's character. And yeah. uh, and then it was Lord Venka. Right? Yeah, and Lord Venka. So does anyone have any thoughts about Lord Venka at all? So you guys would know who Lord Venka is, uh, Elliot. I mean, Arlen and uh, Zach. He was the leader of that caravan that you guys were with. Man, this is not working. This thing isn't working very well. Who else is in here? I think that's all I got. Uh, yeah, that was that was really well done, Hobbs. I'm on top of this thing. <laughs> it says I was Image supposed to. of the vomitors. I couldn't, I couldn't, uh, I couldn't find one. Uh, I, I don't know what I did with it. So um, I had a picture that... of uh, that guy that you killed, that your character killed as well, Zach. So just to let people know who don't know is uh, in the, in the session where we were talking about the um, flashbacks, Elliot's character Melwit failed his role with a really bad role. And so the information he gathered was incorrect about that character and i just think that's so funny to be honest that then that led to uh Siegehelm <laughs> killing him when he was wounded uh by the urson so uh Siegehelm was very decisive this way yeah i like it it was fun <laughs> so what was your guys as gm or as players what was your favorite uh scene or um enemy maybe that you or npc that you ran into arlen do you have any um i so i thought that the the sequence when we first went into sin eater's tomb and um had the sort of 
you know, skeletons from all around coming in. That's, I mean, that's a classic that I really enjoy both as a player and a GM. The, you know, the players are in there and there's sort of, you know, several directions that the mooks are coming from and you've got to, you know, figure out how to deal with all of that. So I thought that was fun. I feel like it's a really great um, way to get a sort of combination of like, oh shit, and I feel like a badass all at once. Right, because if there's a whole bunch of bad guys, there's that, and they're coming from all different directions, crawling out of weird spaces and all that sort of stuff. There's a real tension, but also if you can count them down pretty quickly, it makes the characters feel like a badass, and I think that's kind of a cool, you know, balancing act. You know, mm, nice, Robert. Uh, I did kind of like the the obelisks with the snakes, the two headed snakes. The first kinda... time that you ran into them. Yeah, that was kind of fun and fun encounter. I mean, I just like the obelisk in, in general, just as like a an interesting thing you find on the landscape. So that was pretty cool. I did enjoy uh, Julian's uh, a- attempt to negotiate with the Sun Eater, though. That was a, a fun time. <laughs> <laughs> Elliot, what about you? You have any scenes, or NPCs, or uh, enemies that you found to be top notch? Um, yeah, the, the enemies. There's two that kind of stuck out as like. In, like I thought were cool encounters um, that uh, I actually liked the vomitors like section. I thought that was really interesting and like super unique and it was kind of like a oh shit moment and then we were having to deal with them and I thought like we did an okay job. I don't know that whole like that whole thing felt really cool and like interesting. And then the other part was the uh, with the wolf lizards um in the dark like that was also really cool being like we're in the dark in this cave and then i just imagine them like leaping out like just into the light as then we like hack them down um quickly which <laughs> really those both of the counters are like on two sides of one we got really messed up and then one we completely steamrolled them so that was those i thought were both like interesting well, I think to me. I think only your character got messed up in the vomitors, but I don't know. I, I mean, no, several I of us got really hurt. Yeah. Oh, okay. Nice. All right, Zach. What about you? A long rest after that, right? Uh, yeah, I think my favorite was the the Ursheim camp. Um, I like the whole um, terrain around it, trying to work our way up, climb up the side. Somebody doing the mist prayer to flying them the earth signs we'd already faced one enough to be scared of them so that put a heavy sense of stakes around it knowing that there were multiple of them in there so that was, that was fun talk looking back now at them it really sounds like it was really sword and sorcery not really high fantasy right i mean it's weird that some creatures can spit vomit and blow up when you stab them but just the way that everything kind of transpired, it really felt swords and sorcery to me way more Conan than Ari Salvatore or something like that to me. Mm-hmm. So I think that's cool looking back on it. looks like we had one question. Uh, what, uh, when ending a campaign, this is from Beast King 1980, uh, when ending a campaign, do you leave seeds for a future campaign at the end? Robert, have you ever ent- ended a campaign? I don't know if I really have. I mean, all right. So get I, the fuck out of this question. No, I'm just kidding. No, you I, got played, I mean, I say. played back in the day. My game back in the day was AD and D, but I was like around 10 years old. And so, how did we play that game? We knew probably little of what was actually in the books, and we kind of like we did just like crazy stuff. Like we were always descending into uh, layers of of hell and. Uh, it was like Monty Hall. We had all this like magic item sort of stuff, um, like crazy stuff. And then I went for a long time not playing uh, until like 2015. Um, and I've got some like unfinished campaigns that I ran there when I started back up playing 5e. And so, no, I don't have a campaign that I don't think I've ever really come to a, a firm conclusion. They just petered out. All right. So that's a no. What about you, Arlen? I have definitely ended campaigns. Um, I generally like the idea of having kind of seeds for another campaign in kind of present in the the state where you end the the original 
section that you're playing, I guess, right? Like, you know, the characters presumably could go on, but if you, you know, if you want to come back to these characters in six months, then there's plenty of kind of things for them to, you know, the things for them to do. It's not like, you know, that's it. They, they did it. Um, but I also uh, play a whole lot of different game systems and switch between game systems a lot. So I, I try to, when I end a campaign, have enough closure that I feel like I'm not going to kind of miss it while I'm doing something else, if that makes sense. That, you mm. know, if I, like, for instance, with the One Ring second edition campaign that I really, you know, wanted to get to the point where it was like a real stopping point and that I wasn't going to go, oh, man, I wish I was playing One Ring while I'm, you know, trying all these other games. Right. What about you, Elliot? Um, yeah, I've actually ended multiple campaigns. Um, and I, the question is interesting because I don't know if I really thought about intentionally adding a seed to continue into another campaign versus inherently, depending, especially if a campaign is large, there's going to be, like, plot threads that are just inherently going to be left open. Um, and so then those are always easy to then jump onto to continue moving. So I don't know if I necessarily like, I'm trying to think if I've ever like intentionally added like a, like a cliffhanger moment or like a Marvel after credits scene, you know, to like lead into another one. Um, usually I don't do that because we're going to do something else completely. And then if we come back to it, it's like, Hey, remember that one time, like, could we do that or whatever, you know, to follow another lead? So um, I think it is inherent that, yeah, there are some, but I don't, I can't think of a time where I really, like, added a seed at the end of a campaign in, with the intent of continuing on. Well, he's not necessarily saying adding a scene. He's just, are there a seed? Are there no, seeds? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. All right. What about, what about you, Zach? Yeah, most of the time when I end a campaign, it's like we're putting that setting to the side, but that setting is still there. That that world is still ready to return to. So whatever was going on, we, we might get back to it. I, I don't usually um, end it with a specific hook. Um, although I can't think of one that was my favorite. We weirdly have never returned to it, even though it was like eight years ago now. It was a TPK dying to a dragon and everything and like right after it was like you know what we got to come back to this at some point we want to kill that dragon and i mean it's the classic D D setup thing that you, you want to go get that dragon and it was a revenge thing they knew everything that was going on in the region and they pissed off this dragon but we never did go back to it so that, that's the closest of having a a seed that could have been we'll start a campaign out with like you guys are running down that dragon now and it just never happened. I like it. Obviously, I created a scene a la Marvel at the end just because I thought it was interesting. The Sin Eater was an interesting character. I wasn't really happy with the transition that occurred during the game. And I think some of that was poor writing by me because it didn't totally make sense. I knew that I wanted to have these creatures that had broken into the tomb that he was unhappy about. But how did they get to the top? And where did Thelman get in and Eddard get in versus what was going on. All of that was kind of didn't necessarily ever uh, solidify in my brain. It just kind of congealed lightly. And then I just said, ah, fuck it after that. But uh, the end scene where I, I like the idea of this horrific creature that was put in here, even by these evil people, the soon uh, put in there and, you know, and it's growing and creating issues. And I thought it was nice to like tap back into that. And then I also wanted to all do the same thing that the other campaign, the uh, Chronicle of the Cursed Axe ended with, which is uh, the Serpent Men armies coming. And um, anyone who knows anything about the Midlands know that this is one of the meta plots that exists and that campaign was really about stopping it, where this one wasn't. This one had nothing to do with it. You guys were just innocent bystanders, really. You could have got involved in it, but it doesn't matter if you did or not, you know. And it doesn't mean that the game's over um, and that you could never play these characters again or anything like that. Now it might be fleeing the jungle because massive armies are, you know, wandering around. Um, but there's a lot of stuff that I had written in this in this 11 by or 12 by 12 hex area. So... Well, it'll be interesting to see, you know, what other people do with it. And if I run another game, 
around this area. Like I, in the Midlands game, I'll probably have this happening, but it's so far away in Northgate compared to this area where, where this is happening in the Surat jungle that it won't really mean a lot, although it could draw troops like the Argosan King may draw troops from Northgate. And so there won't be as many like, say, uh, like the Stargazer won't be there to control the anointed, which is like a jackbooted villains of the setting in some way. So that maybe makes some difference. I don't know. We'll see. But I don't know if I have anything else. Thanks, uh, Goblin Scribe Gaming. I don't know if I'm the real GM and I would uh, combat Matt Mercer in any way. Uh, basically goblin scribe gaming says i think it'd be a pretty cool and be very cool to have a section on for streaming gms and help combat the matt mercer stuff get a real gm out there uh, in my own way i feel like i do combat that because my game is really most almost always ran old school uh it's usually has a lot of maps and a lot of tactile um tactile tactical interaction um but other than that you know i don't know does anyone else have anything to add about that uh, zero interest in the about thing. writing a book about being the real GM or what? <laughs> yeah, I guess so. Yeah, write it, Hobbs. <laughs> yeah. I feel like I feel like every time I'm streaming, I'm writing that. It's just I'm writing it um, electronically, and, and not like something that you're gonna read. You're gonna learn way more if you can stomach uh, watching me run a game than you are if I just wrote it. In my opinion, I don't know. Maybe I should have more. I always thought it would be cool to run a game. <laughs> yeah, that uh, um, you could then break in and talk about it as the GM, like what you were thinking, uh, what products you were using, you know, why you did this, what you did, and then maybe have players comment on that as well. As you went along, that would be kind of a cool, cool thing. Maybe it's just like watching a yeah. movie with the actors and the writers talking about why like they did a, the things they did. Like a, a commentary track for the campaign. Yeah. I think that would yeah. be, that might be neat. Yeah, didn't we, cool. didn't yeah, we like kind of do that? Yeah. That's kind of what I was hoping a little bit here, um, but we didn't. I mean, I didn't really go deeply into what I was using sure. in yeah. during the game. I I kind of break in sometimes and say, "Hey, these are the rules, and this is what I'm doing." But I, sometimes that gets boring. I mean, and I can watch Zach, and he always seems like he's ready to like kiss his dog goodnight, and you know, mm -hmm. I want to keep the action going, you know. Uh, I don't know. I think you could, because I know you've, Hobbs, you've streamed like game prep sometimes and yep. videos like that on YouTube. I think you could do an interesting, I, I wouldn't, I probably wouldn't do it for like a, a long campaign because I think it would A, get old quickly and B, it would uh, feel like it was kind of disruptive to the sort of larger plot of the long campaign. But I think you could, right, if you were going to do like a one shot, you could, you know, have like one episode is me prepping for the one shot one episode is the one shot itself and one episode is like all of the players and you kind of talking about the one shot i've considered doing more of those prep uh, videos but one of my problems is most of the people that play in my games are the ones who actually like watching what well, they like watching me do this stuff so it would be different you could you like know? not stream it and just put it on youtube after you run the game right that's true i mean you wouldn't get anything on twitch from it but you know yeah that's all right though all right so we had some conversation about matt mercer and uh oh. beast king 1980 yeah, saying who is also a good gm by the way that is yeah i'm not saying he he's a bad gm <laughs> he definitely has more hair he's he definitely runs a game in a different way than i do oh, their campaigns yeah, are different completely styles. different and my players are much different than his players <laughs> yes. so yeah. much better looking and and he has what, what, wait, what was that last part much better looking my players are that's what i said yeah <laughs> oh okay i thought you were saying his his players are much better no looking. i was saying my play i was lying obviously but <laughs> 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 i mean it, right. it's the difference between a real game and i mean i know there's all this debate about i don't want to go into it with critical role but whether they're really playing or whether it's all staged but they're actors i mean they're obviously acting they're improv improv acting right so am i god damn it i'm a method actor i, I was stunned you guys didn't pick irks as your favorite npc i don't think you asked us about our favorite npc i did i said moment. no i said favorite scene or favorite npc or favorite monster any of those things 
Oh, I think I just followed suit with the monster thing because everyone else mentioned monsters. The, yeah, I know. He said, and if you wanted us to choose one of you. Well, uh, also, yeah, he was the only it. significant NPC that we spent any significant amount of time with. <laughs> so he's sort yeah. of the default. But he was terrible, NPC though. Choice. He was Actually, horrible. I would have picked the Sin Eater instead of Urx. As my yes, favorite. that's what I thought. Yeah. <laughs> I picked her up. <laughs> 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 all right guys uh, i told you about an hour and it's been an hour and a half and that doesn't count the half hour before that that uh, it took me to set everything up so uh once again i want to uh tell you guys thanks for playing especially i mean not especially but also including arlen and zach for kind of jumping in in the middle when hawk pushed out because he's so flipping old um <laughs> He did that after his character died too, so it seems like that was the. Yeah, I, I really think that was it, <laughs> but but I don't know because he's so he's so used to his characters dying. It doesn't matter. So uh, yeah, wasn't there a TPK like every other session of Chronicle of the Cursed Axe? No, no, no. It was pretty close to that. No, there was only one there was TPK. A lot of character death in that campaign. Can you guys? Uh, how hard would it be to kill all your characters off with this game system? pretty hard right i mean it it almost happened a couple times uh, granted it would be difficult with the because the there has there's that like rescue and like party retreat mechanic um like to actually do a full-on tpk but i mean I don't well know. and i think it, I it also it, it kind of depends on like um how because a lot of that stuff is really on the players so if your players aren't paying attention it's much easier to tpk them as opposed to some games where it's hard to TPK them whether or not they're paying a whole lot of attention to the kind of special oh. stuff. Well, I probably don't play those games, so. <laughs> probably. <laughs> uh, all right, just in case, when I was laughing about something earlier, I was laughing about, uh, I don't know, it doesn't matter. I'll, I'll tell you guys later. Anyhow, thanks everyone for joining me uh, uh, at the Gamerhood and listening to us babble on about our campaign. And I hope uh, that this is like some closure for you guys, the players, and for you guys, the spectators. I know that it's closure for me. Uh, so let's 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 leave to the dulcet tones of T.J. Drennan. <laughs>